It's a great privilege to be here on this uh, very, very delightful, beautiful Sabbath morning. And uh, come we that love the Lord, right? And let our joys be known. There's no joy like the joy of knowing Jesus. With my sister and uh, my brothers who had the privilege, uh, particularly my brothers, uh, of growing up in our teen years in the great back blocks of Warakoe. <laughs> near to poverty and the great privilege of going to the University of uh, Titoki District High School. The greater privilege uh, back when I was 15 and some of you may have been there the day I think my mother and uh, some of my family were baptized in the uh, former church on Norfolk Street. Never forget that wonderful wonderful day when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. The keynote of the Christian life should be trusting in Jesus, walking with God, and rejoicing in Jesus every moment of every day. My brother Gary uh, came to New Zealand about seven weeks ago, and then uh, with my brother Moss, some of you know him, and his wife, they went off to uh, Australia uh, to meet and to be with Owen, who is now the pastor of the Barrel Church south of Sydney on the way to Canberra. I had the privilege uh, three weeks ago of speaking in the, Can in the Barrel Church. And then we made our way north uh, to uh, Tweed Heads, where former pastor of this church, Errol Wright and Zena, are uh, living, and we had the privilege of spending three or four days with them near Coolangatta. Then we uh, journeyed down and uh, we met a uh, fellow that some of you know and may be related to, uh, Danny Crocombe. How many know Danny Crocombe? Ah, went out to his farm there and uh, he took us on a tour of his wonderful area. I wish I could live there. He grows pineapples and he grows uh, wonderful citrus, he grows bananas. All sorts of things. So we had a wonderful time that day of visiting with Danny. And then a couple of days later, we made our way to the uh, seniors. That's a better name, right? The seniors of New South Wales um, camp meeting at Stewart Point where we had a fantastic Sabbath and a wonderful Sunday morning. And then it was time later that week to come over to New Zealand. So my brother Gary was here until uh, Thursday morning. But before we left, we made sure we went to Matapuri. There's no beach or no beautiful scene in my book like Matapuri. I wish it was Christmas time with the Puhutakawas, my favorite tree, would have been in bloom. Then we journeyed on uh, to uh, Woolies Bay. How many know Woolies Bay? Just before Sandy Bay, right? And we love g going to there because uh, from what Gary, and he's an authority on ancient uh, batches or accommodation of cabins and he pointed to one he said that's where our mother took us you know that would be in the early 50s or the late 40s something like that took us on a fantastic holiday that we never forgot and so uh, we had a very very wonderful time up here and also uh, in Napier last Sabbath so today I want us to have a little scripture reading and um, uh, I hope you all bring your Bible. Thy word is what? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119, 105. Is that true? And the entrance of thy words giveth light. We live in a world of darkness. This is a book from heaven. This is the lighthouse of God's truth to guide mankind through the ages and to prepare them for the coming of Jesus. So I want you to turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. The Gospel of John. Read these amazing verses, right? Amazing verses. Because this is going to be uh, for our meditation today. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was 
God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, that's the universe, all things were made through Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. In Him was life. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth through darkness, and the darkness defeats it not. Coming to verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own people, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of, as of the only monogenes, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You have just listened to some of the most vital, important, and amazing words ever written in history. It has been said that the first 18 verses of John chapter 1 should have been written in letters of gold. It has been said that this book is the most, the book of, of John, the Gospel of John, is one of the most important books ever written as part of the Bible. Now, Bible, we can all spell B I B L E. That stands for basic, heavenly, basic instructions before leaving earth. And I want to tell you, in spite of all the fiction and nonsense that's written in the world today and people getting all sorts of Booker Prizes and all that uh, from, from fantasy and fiction, the Bible has no rival in human history. This book is the lamp of life eternal, giving to us mortals groping in darkness and foolishness and sin, to find the ultimate purpose and meaning of life in this world. Growing up as a teenager, and particularly out there at Warakoe, we couldn't come into the church every Sabbath. We had no car until finally, many years later, my father bought an old, old Dodge. So we used to have Sabbath worship out in the tea tree when it was sunny and warm. And our mother was the teacher and instructor to guide us. I had to, as a young person, because Christianity is a thinking person's religion. You don't have to think to be an atheist. You just have to believe nonsense and foolishness. Because even the sound of music says nothing Nothing comes from nothing. And I used to say to my mother, you know, Mum, how can I believe in a God I haven't seen? That's true, right? I wrestled in my mind as a young man going to high school about the existence of God. I struggled to know about the origin of the universe. And my mother used to say to me, just believe the Bible. But we have got to think. But I want to say to you today, my friends and loved ones in Jesus, because we are members of the remnant church, which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We have the final specifications to justify the existence of our movement, which is taking the everlasting gospel into the, all the world in this generation. 
So I wondered and battled, right? But I want to tell you today, the purpose of your existence and your birth, whether you're born in Taiwan, Singapore, South Africa, the Middle East, wherever, your purpose, my friends, today of being born into this world is to become a child of God, to be a Christian, a Bible Christian. That's why you were born. You were born to know God personally. You were born to know the truth about God. And as Archbishop Temple said many years ago, if you do not understand the truth about God's character, it would be better for you to be an atheist. And the Muslim terrorists, I'm ashamed, are proving that every day on the news channels and in the newspapers when they will slaughter, betray, and capture in the name of their God innocent people and even put them to death. Now, I'm not racist or anything like that, but I'm saying the truth. If you do not have the true understanding of God's glorious character and that God is a God of eternal love and that God has no pleasure in the final destruction of the wicked, then you don't have the true character, concept of the character of God. So here, John was about 80 years old he was the pastor of the Ephesus Church in southwest Turkey, one of the most amazing ruins of any ancient city from the ancient world. John was the pastor. And you can still see the ruins of a church built in the 4th and 5th century, the church of St. John the Divine. You can still see the ruins there, right? Many after, years after his decease. But he was getting an older man, and he was worried about the heresies. A heresy is a truth that's taken out of its context and distorted and becomes abnormal. That's what a heresy is. You could take any truth of the Bible and make it into a heresy. You could, you could take the most beautiful subject of the Bible, justification by faith, and make it a heresy and that, that say, oh, I believe and I can live like I like. You are justified as a Christian by Jesus that you might be sanctified and prepared to go to heaven. Because that's the bottom line of every successful life is that you are ready to meet God when Jesus comes again. And be amongst the people who look up and say, Lo, we have waited for you, O our God. We have waited for you. You have come and you will save us. And we will rejoice in your salvation throughout the days of eternity. So here it is. John is 80 years old and he sees these heresies. Heresies about Jesus, right? From the Gnostics. Heresies that were saying that Jesus wasn't literally God. He wasn't literally a person. He was a manifestation of God. And to get to know God, you would go through various cycles, right? It's Gnosticism coming from Greek philosophy that was going, was preparing to, dis, to challenge and defeat Christianity. So John writes this book for you and me. He writes this book on those who would hear the good news of the glorious salvation, who would surrender to the claims and authority of Jesus and make him Lord of their lives, their Savior and their friend. He writes it for all Christians in all ages and those particularly living in the 21st century. And that's for you and me today. And he's telling us the truth about Jesus. He's telling us the truth about life. He's telling us the truth about eternity, which are being challenged by the secular society, in the universities, in the media, even by Hollywood, and even by religious thought thinkers today who do not believe in the inspired word of God, that every word of God is pure and refined and truth from the courts of heaven. So... He begins this letter, right? Writing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And he says, In the beginning was the Word. Now I want to tell you something that may sound like a contradiction. In the beginning, that's a beginning that never had a beginning. 
Jesus was before the beginning, and he's talking about creation, right? Because the Bible tells us that the God of the universe, the God of Revelation, is a God from eternity to eternity. Now, we weren't in eternity, but by God's grace through the everlasting gospel, we can be in eternity in the future, even though we may fall asleep before the resurrection and the life comes from heaven. So he says here, in the beginning was the Word. Now, the Word is logos, a Greek word. And the logos means the reason or the power or the person behind the universe. See, pantheists say that you are God and I'm God and everything is God, the trees and the grass, right? And they look at the stars and the moons and they say, everything's God. That's phony as, as can be, right? But if you look at the universe and we, you know, 14 billion light years or more, the universe, which had a beginning, even atheists and agnostics declare that science has proved there was a beginning, there was a beginning. They call it the Big Bang, but we call it the Big Creation, right? Yeah, because they don't have room for God, but God has room for them. So you look at the universe, 14 billion light years, but God is outside the known universe. He is above the universe. He's greater than the universe because he made it. Must be a big God. Must be a powerful God. So in the beginning was the Logos, the creator, the living God, the one who inhabits eternity. And then he continues, continues to say, and the word was with God. That means the word, the Logos, has had a timeless existence. There was never a time when the, when the Logos or the Word did not exist. Now, that's awesome, but it must be the truth. Some, something comes from some, something, doesn't it? Nothing comes from nothing. There's no such thing as chance. This world, this universe wasn't created by chance. It wasn't created by spontaneous generation. It was made by a creator. Just like this lovely car you drove yourself to come to worship. By the way, worship in God's house, in God's day, unchangeable time, is the most beautiful and wonderful and joyful experience that we should have week by week. So when it comes to Sunday, you're already thinking about this wonderful day when you will meet with the members of the family of God. And you will count it a supreme privilege to be a child of God. No greater privilege. So in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the mind behind the universe. And the Word was with God the Father. And then this awesome statement, right? This statement that people who knock on doors, when we should be knocking on doors before them, deny because they say the Word was a God. No, the Greek and the greatest authorities uh, of the Greek text in the world will say this is exactly what it means. The Word, the Logos, was God. Wow. Not a God. Because if you believe in God the Father and you believe Jesus is a God, you are a polytheist. You don't believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You believe in two gods, a big God and a little God. That is phony. That is false. That is unbiblical. That is twisting the Scripture and denying the glory that belongs to Jesus alone. So, this remarkable verse here tells us that God is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the eternal God. He's the God who holds up the universe in His hands. He's the God that guides and leads the universe. It holds together, Colossians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1. He holds the universe together. Then he says here this amazing statement, verse 3. All things were made through Him. Now, all things, along with Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, 
All things means the universe. All things. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So this declares to us, without the shadow of a doubt, that Jesus and Jesus alone is the creator. That when the Bible says, he commanded, he spake and it stood fast, he commanded and it was made, it's talking about Jesus. By the way, Jesus is the one who gave the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Hebrews chapter, chapter 12, the end, end verses of chapter 12. So Jesus is the theme of the Bible. Jesus is the Lord of history. Jesus is the great creator. Now Francis Bacon, the great British philosopher, said many years ago, The Lord did not go out of his way to convince an atheist that he is creator because his ordinary works all around us prove it. I see the power of God everywhere I go. I want to tell you, if I had a choice... I would like to live in Manu at Puri Park Road. Anybody live there? When I phone up my sister, right, and, you know, I think of all the Fijoas and Persimmons and all these good things you New, Ze New Zealanders enjoy, right? And I say to my sister, you know, I say, I wish I lived on Puri Park Road. <laughs> but I want to tell you why I'm saying this is because everything throughout New Zealand declares a mighty creator. New Zealand is a paradise. One of my daughters said, Dad, however did you leave New Zealand? Well, that happened at Kaikoui. I took a series of meetings in Kaikoui many years ago. And, uh, by, uh, and we had three little girls, so I asked the president, my wife and her parents would like our grandparents, uh, the, uh, our children's grandparents, to see their grandchildren, right? But the reply from Auckland was no, and we didn't accept that reply. So this is the result, right? <laughs> but what I'm saying to you, that no New Zealander who thinks straight can, can say that he is an honest, in, uh, an atheist of integrity because everything proves there's a creator. The greatest scientists around the world, cannot make one blade of grass. Think about this. Everything's made up of atoms. Oh, yes, modern man has been able to split the atom, but no, no scientist has been able to make one solitary atom. The atom proves that there is a creator. The wonder of your body proves that there is a mighty creator. That we can see, right? That we can hear. That we have a hundred billion brain cells, right? That we have at least in our bodies a trillion cells, and every one of those cells is a miracle. Every one of them is a miracle. So that the Bible says, the fool says there's no God. The fool. But Jesus says, my friends... Have faith in God. Have faith in God. So the wonders of creation, the marvels of creation, prove that there is a creator. And John tells us the truth. Now, I have had the great privilege of uh, taking some Canadians, mainly Canadians, uh, to Israel. And I say, you know, including New Zealand, for the Christian, for the Christian... There's no more wonderful country in the world to visit but Israel. Because history is his story. Do you understand that? History. He's the Alpha, he's the beginning of history, and he's the Omega. He's the beginning of history, and he's the conclusion of history. And in the center of history is the old rugged cross. Now, Back in the early 30s, H.V. Morton wrote a wonderful book, which is still available online. 
called In the Steps of the Master. You can take your Bible in one hand and you can read what H.V. Morton, and he was a brilliant writer, wrote about Bethlehem, about Nazareth, about Capernaum, about Jerusalem. The Bible says he came into his own. It is saying in the center of history, the Creator visited planet Earth. This is a visited planet. Not by Armstrong, who in 1969 was the first man to walk on the moon, but by the Creator himself, tabernacled in human flesh. So, when you walk through the old villages of Capernaum, you are walking in the footsteps of the Lord of history. When you go down into the Garden of Gethsemane, and you don't have to go there, right? But if you go down to the Garden of Gethsemane, you are in the proximate location where Jesus cried to his Father, Father, spare me of this cup. If possible, take this cup, the cross, death away from me. But not my will but thine be done. You can walk out to the garden too, most likely near the Damascus Gate, and you can possibly see the very place where Jesus was crucified because the hill, even today after 2,000 years, still looks like a human skull with a nose and eyes. And Calvary means skull, cranium. And so what I'm saying here is history and archaeology are proving the accuracy and the authority and the genuineness of Jesus' visit to planet Earth. So it says here, he repeats it in verse 10, He was in the world. And the world was made by him. Even the skeptic, H.G. Wells, had to write a chapter on Jesus. And he spoke about the pale Galilean who was still impressing and helping human beings. You cannot deny history. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now, one of the key verses here is verse 4. In him was life, that's divine life, that is more than biological life. In him was life, Zoe, and the life was the light of men. He is saying here that the source of life, creation, the source of all life flows from Jesus. As the psalmist said in Psalm 36, Thou art the fountain of life. Now modern man, atheists and skeptics and scientists, cannot figure out that we have consciousness. Where does it come from? We have these marvelous minds. We have the power to choose. We have the power to think. We have the power to reason, right? They cannot, cannot figure that out. Because a mindless universe cannot produce the brilliance and the complexity of your human brain. Never can, never will. That is the most complex system in all the universe is your brain. And the Lord doesn't want you destroying your brain with alcohol. Because it's by the brain that we communicate communicate with God. It is through the brain we have understanding. This great light, the light of truth, the light throwing, flowing from the throne of the universe because God dwells in light and the light of the world visited this planet to, to, to help us to see the difference between light and darkness, good and evil, and that we might have that divine privilege of making every day a great choice to love God, to walk with God, and to be the friends of the God of the universe. So in him was life. Original, unborrowed. Can anyone finish it? In Christ, desire of ages, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, and underived. Wow. That's an awesome statement. The most wonderful biography ever written, spiritual biography ever written in human history is the book Desire of Ages. Read the first chapter. Talking about the God of the universe 
and that Jesus came to reveal the Father, not only to mankind, but to unfallen worlds, to reveal the truth about God, that God is merciful, God is true, God is compassionate, God is forgiving, God is just, God is holy, and those who love Him and walk with Him are going to dwell with God forever and ever and ever. So, as we look at this amazing chapter, notice what it says. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I spoke to, uh, to one of uh, Ronnie uh, Winters. He's a, a, a great uh, tour guide in Israel. His best friend, he told me some years ago, is a Seventh-day Adventist minister, then living in Virginia, United States. But I asked him, I said, who, Ronnie Winter, who is the greatest Jew who's ever lived? And without the, within a second, he said, Jesus Christ. So here's a Jew, secular Jew, who's got to admit the facts of history that no Jew has ever lived greater and more powerful and more authoritative authoritative who has impacted human history than Jesus. So he's more than just an ordinary man. He is great. Gabriel said to Mary, the one that's going to be, he will be great. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Jesus said something important for you and me. In Luke 22, 29, he said to his followers, I appoint unto you a kingdom. Now, Prince Charles is waiting to take the kingdom. I don't know if he's worthy or not. And behind him is a Prince William who's waiting to become king. All the kingdoms of this world are going to pass away. But of his kingdom, of the kingdom of glory, the kingdom of the redeemed, there will be no end. And you and I here today are to worship God, to love God, to adore God, and to walk with God, and to prepare for that unending kingdom of glory, which will come because Christ said, I will come again. And where I am, there you shall be also. So this is just a, a thrilling passage of Scripture. Notice here, verse 12, But as many as received him, that means to accept personally. You know, the Bible pictures Jesus in the end time, in the time of the church of Laodicea. It says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, doesn't say any man, in the Greek it says anyone, so it includes male and female. If anybody hear my voice and open the door, I will come into his life, I will sup with him, I will enjoy life with him, and he with me. Jesus says that he wants to share his grace and his presence in your life on a daily basis. But it calls for what we call a decision. It calls for a volitional decision of your will. You know, you might uh, uh, say, well, I believe my house is burning down. So you turn to the wife, your wife, and you say, I believe our house is burning down right now. And you just sit there, right? And she said, you believe the house is burning down? As if that's good news, right? A man would not just sit there. He would be out to get the garden hose and call the fire department immediately, Right? He may believe it, but unless there's an action, he does not really believe. And so I can get the 28, 28 fundamentals, beautiful transcript of Bible truth, and I can say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I, I, I believe in the second coming, but do nothing about it. You don't do anything about it. You do not really believe. Because when it says, believe with all your heart and you will be saved, it means to live by Live by. Many people, even pastors, believe that the seventh day is a Sabbath. But to keep their jobs and their parishioners, they don't do anything about it. Occasionally some did, right? We have that uh, 
pastor down there in the southern states, he thought the Adventist church were not really a church. I'll put it that way, right? But he read the commandments twice removed. He couldn't put that book down. He read it four or five times. And he realized that God has a people who's keeping the right day in honor of the glorious creation of God. So to believe means to act, to live by. If I believe Jesus is coming again, I will want to prepare to meet him. I was walking uh, two weeks ago uh, at Scott's Head just before going to the, to the seniors camp meeting. They call it Grey Nomads, but I don't like that term. But in any case, uh, and I was walking along. Just, just get a little exercise, right? Because Dr. Sang Lee, anybody heard of Sang Lee? He said some years ago at the British Columbia Hope Camp meeting, he says, if you love God and you walk in the sunshine and you walk in the sunshine and you're thanking God for all the blessings and the goodness of God, every cell of your body is impacted positively. <laughs> so I was having a walk. And uh, I saw a sign. And it said, bushfires. Be prepared. It's your responsibility. I like that statement. Jesus is coming. There's going to be a big fry. Be prepared that you may escape the destruction that's going to come upon planet Earth. So, verse 14. Magnificent words. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. What does that mean? What, the Word, the Creator, was made what? A human being. Thank you. Yeah. That is the miracle of all miracles. How could the Creator be formed in the body, in the womb, of a young Jewish maiden? How could it be? Isaiah said it would be, right? He said a virgin will conceive. He said the people who dwelt in darkness, that's around Nazareth and Galilee, would see a great light, the light of the world. And his name shall be called what? Wonderful. Everything about Jesus is wonderful. Just because you don't understand things doesn't mean to say they're not real. I can't see the radio programs coming through the air on the airwaves, can you? I can't see the television uh, 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 waves as they come through the air, but they're there, right? I can't see my brains, but I think they're there because I do think, and God says it's a responsibility to think. <laughs> okay, yes. Now, I don't understand the incarnation, but I believe it because 330 prophecies in the Old Testament said Jesus is coming. Jesus is going to be the Lamb of God. Jesus is going to be born of a virgin. He's going to be born in, in Bethlehem. He, he, he's going to be the light and glory of, of God. He's, he's going to honor God's law and make it honorable, not going to destroy it, make it glorious. And he did in the Sermon on the Mount. Everything about Jesus is magnificent. It's beyond our understanding, but it is true because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is God with us. He said over and over again, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Atheists do not want to do God's will. They want to do their thing. They want to live their lifestyle. But one day we will all stand before God. And the Bible says someone, many of them will ru run to the Parahaki Hills, right, and say, fall upon us, you mighty trees and you mighty rocks. Hide us from the face of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. People say, why doesn't Jesus come? He wants people to be ready. He wants people to be watching. He wants people to be praying. He wants people to be ready to walk the golden streets and to sing, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So, the Word 
was made flesh. A human being. God could only communicate to us through a human being. Now we come into this world to live. Jesus came into the world to die for you and me. That we might have his life, although he would suffer our death. We might have his peace, although he would take the guilt and the shame and the remorse and the pain upon him. Jesus. How we need to love Jesus. How we need to focus upon Jesus, Christ in you by faith, through the Holy Spirit day by day. The hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. Christ as your friend. Christ the head of your home. Christ, the one who will walk with you through the valley of the shadows of death. So you will not fear death because he's conquered death. And although you have pain and storms in your life, they will only prepare you to be ready to meet Jesus. Because nothing will come upon you that God will not permit. Nothing. The hairs of your head are all numbered. Some of us are losing a few. Not even a little sparrow falls to the ground. But our Heavenly Father knows all about it. There's nothing about you that God doesn't know about. He knows where you are, where you're sitting. He knows that you're thinking about your lunch right now. He knows everything. Yeah. But He's giving the world the opportunity. So the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. A visited planet. Muggeridge said, the most stupendous event in human history is what took place in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. When the angels sang, glory to God. And that song we're told in Desire of Ages is to go on and on and on until he comes again. You walk with God, you love God, he will give you a new song to sing every day. When you get up in the morning, don't worry about listening to, what is it, 1ZB or whatever. In any case, you listen to God. When you begin the day, kneel before the great creator and talk with him as friend with him. Friend, You cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. And when you begin the day, remember this. When you wash, you say, wash me, Lord, and I shall be whiter than snow. Our hearts need washing, right? We think the things we shouldn't think. And the things we should think, we don't think as we should. Wash me, O God. Purge me. Make me whiter than snow. And when you get dressed, ready for the day, you say this to the Lord. Clothe me with the garment of your righteousness. Cover me with the robe of righteousness. You begin every day with God who loves you with an everlasting love. And you say to God every day, in other words, you have a devotional experience as a Christian. The Bible is God speaking to you, and in prayer is your response. Every sincere prayer is written in heaven. I am challenging my friends and my family in God here today to make God real, to make Jesus the center of your life, your affection, and your hope. Love not this wicked world, which condones all forms of immorality. Love not this wicked world, this corrupt world, this world that's going down to destruction, this world that denies God. This world that knows nothing about heaven or the coming of Jesus. This world that's rushing down, down, down to degradation and sin. Love not the world. That's what John's meaning. First John chapter 2 verse 15. Nor the things that are in this world. If you love these filthy rock musicians and their style and all that they're doing, you are preparing for destruction. Did you hear that? You won't ask me again, will you? In any case, but this is the truth. You cannot love a filthy, godless, sin-loving world that defies the moral law of God and be ready for Jesus to come. That's why the Bible says, prepare to meet your God when He comes again, that you might 
know that our God shall come. All right? Our God will come. As Jesus says, I will come again. So the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. Jesus came to reveal the truth about God. And if you're a husband that uses foul language and you're beat up in your wife, you are not a Christian. You can take the title or anything you like. Christianity makes us kind. Christianity makes us true. Christianity makes us compassionate. Christianity makes us caring. Did you hear that? Christianity makes us loving. And how long is it since you husbands have told your wives that you really love them? for the character and the people that they are. I tell you, you know, my wife, she wanted a little bigger fi family than or ordinary, right? We had six ch ch children. Wow. Six, right? Six children. Now I've got 13 grandchildren. And my wife has worked so hard, it's unbelievable, but she loves it. But you know, when you love somebody... You will do anything for them. So husbands, love your wives. Don't come to church looking like a priest when at heart you are unkind and miserable and nasty and talk back and sharp. The evidence that we love Jesus because he first loved us is that we become like Jesus. Become like Jesus. I dare not ask these wives here, how many would like their husbands to be like Jesus. I dare not ask it. <laughs> but what I'm saying, you can go home today with peace with God. Because what does it say here? Look what it says here. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten, the, the unique one of the Father, full of what? Full of grace and truth. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. I once was mean. I once was selfish. I once was proud. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And when we have spent 10,000 years, eternity has just begun. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Jesus is in the work of seeking and saving the lost as he was many years ago. Whether it be Bartimaeus, whether it be the fellow who climbed the tree, whether it be even Judas, he could have been saved, but he made the wrong decision. Jesus is in the business of making new people. If any man be in Christ, he is a brand new creation. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I will send you the greatest gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are told in Desire of Ages, when you accept the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life every day, heaven will bring all other blessings in its train. Someone told me this week that they heard that Jamie Oliver, the British cook, is worth... $480 million. You and I can't even dream about that, can we? We can hardly dream about 480 sometimes. Take the world. What does it profit a man? I'm not talking about him. Take the world, right? But give me Jesus. What does it profit anybody? Okay. If he has the whole world and doesn't have Jesus, you and I can be rich. The book of James says to the believers, you are poor, and then he says something else. He says, you are rich. Rich in God's mercy, rich in truth, rich in blessings, that you may walk with God all the days of your life and that you may be ready for Jesus to come. Some years ago, Malcolm Muggeridge, I think he was an atheist. He was an agnostic. Uh, he was a man of the world. He was a man of fame. He was a man of fortune. He was a man who lived less than an honorable life. He was sent by the BBC down to Bethlehem to 
give the Bethlehem story for the boys and girls of Great Britain in the early 50s. And his crew was filming around the church and the nativity and the shepherd's fields and so on. And he stopped and he thought, we are not filming a legend or a myth. We are, for, we are filming some of the greatest events ever happened in history. And he became a Christian and a defender of the Christian faith. And he said before he died, he said, I had money, I had fame, I had fortune, I had all that a man could desire. But all of that was not worth 10 seconds in the presence of Jesus day by day. So today, the Lord stands at your heart and my heart, the Lord of glory, the Lord of truth, the friend of sinners. He stands at our heart and says, Behold, I come quickly. He says more than that as we close. Look at Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Can I hear those pages turning? He says here, these wonderful promises. Verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the home of God is with men, and he himself will, desire, will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne, that's Jesus, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, write, for these words are faithful and these words are true. And he said unto me, It is finished, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I give unto him that is thirsty of the fountain and the water of life freely. And he that overcometh, he that conquereth, shall inherit all things. Wow. All things. Then in Revelation chapter 22, as we close, it says here, Revelation 22, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, no more sin, no more rebellion, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, shall worship Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign how long? Forever and ever. How long is that? That's eternity. That's world without end. And until Jesus comes, until that day, he says in Matthew 28 and verse 20, I will be with you all the days, every day of your life, till I come and take you home. So, my dear friends, I want to commend you to God. I want to commend you to the word of his grace which is able to build you up so you grow to be more like Jesus. You grow to be more like Jesus day by day. Change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. I commend you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance with the saints forever and ever. May every day you say, take the sinful world, Lord. Every day is not a Tuesday. But every day is a Tuesday. Begin every day with God. Walk with God. As Enoch did, right? I was at uh, Avondale College some years ago, E.E. E. White. And he told the story about Enoch. And he says, you know, Enoch, after the birth of his son, with that responsibility, began to walk with God as he had never walked before. And every day, he walked a little closer to God, a little further. And one day, God said to Enoch, Enoch, you're closer to my home than your home, so come home to my home today. And, he, and God took him without seeing death. The Lord bless you and keep you. May every day, by faith, the just shall live by faith. May every day you depend on God's amazing grace. Paul, as he wrote nearly every letter, maybe except the book of Romans, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And you live by faith. The just shall live by faith. 
and faith is forsaking all, forsaking sin, forsaking selfishness, forsaking this world, forsaking all, I take him, Jesus. May that be your prayer. And may we have the great joy of meeting again when Jesus comes. Amen. It's all about Jesus. Well, we're going to sing our closing hymn. I love this hymn. I want to help the choristers uh, at the, on the last verse. But there's a wonderful, wonderful hymn. Hymn name number 86. How great thou art.
it's been a great joy and privilege for us to come and to worship you today in spirit and in truth. Lord, we stand amazed at your greatness and your glory. We, we stand amazed that you had the power and authority to create this beautiful world in which we live. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of knowing you through Jesus, who came to reflect your character, your goodness, your plans, and your mercy. Today, dear God, we want to make a, a new and decided decision that we want to be reconciled to you. We want to be truly your sons and daughters. In a sinful world, we want to live a godly, good, and holy life. Lord, we thank thee for the historical Jesus. We thank thee today that he is our great high priest in your presence. We need none other. He is the bishop of our souls. He is the mediator to bring us to you through grace, to your glory. And now, dear God, bless everyone that's worshipped here today. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our, uh, our hearts be acceptable in your sight and help us to be ready to meet Jesus in that soon coming day of reward and, re uh, and to be with our loved ones and friends and our family to be in your glorious kingdom, saved by your magnificent grace. We thank thee and praise thee in the name of Jesus our Lord and the great Savior of men. Amen and amen.